Bingo! I'm Jay Fidel, 4 o'clock rock. We are having an interesting day today. We are learning so much. We have now uh, Jessie Chen. She's a student of, uh, oh, ec economics and also environmental management, a great combination. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the economy and you, and we entitled this episode, The World is Our Oysters, <laughs> intentionally plural, okay? Mm -hmm. So, Jessie, um, what, what's, your, what's your training? What's your direction that we would be talking about oysters today? I like oysters. Well, uh, my background is actually in ecology and, and evolution, but after undergrad, I found that but that kind of science was missing was more of a human element. And um, so I started thinking, you know, what's a good way to sort of combine, um, you know, big picture ecological science and humans. And so I started thinking about Ooh. food, especially <laughs> because I'm from California originally. And as you probably know, we're going through a historic drought right now. So it's got me thinking a lot about food insecurity. And I don't think there's anywhere more food insecure than the Pacific Island nations. Um, including Hawaii as a state. And um, so I applied to the master's degree program um, at UH Manila and found myself um, fitting into this project that I actually initially knew absolutely nothing about uh, as far as, I, I know nothing about oysters, I knew nothing about Hawaiian fish ponds, but um, my advisor, Dr. Ping Sun Leung, decided to take a chance on me. He said he liked my application and invited me onto this project. And so I just, I just dived right in, and the more I learned about it, the more I realized how passionate I was about local food production. What's, what school is this at UH? Is this at UH? Yeah, this is at UH. Um, I'm in the, in the College of, let's see, CTAR, Tropical, College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, mm. uh, specifically in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Management. Mm. Is, is CTAR active in this? Or are you the only one? Uh, well, I'm the only student on the project, mm. if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. But I do have a, a team of, of PhD colleagues, my advisor, Dr. Mm -hmm. Ping Sun Leung, who's also in our department um, and is a top-notch economist. Uh, I also work with Dr. Maria Haas at UH Hilo, and she is the expert on shellfish in Hawaii. And we also work with Dr. Quentin Fong, who's a marketing specialist, um, especially with seafood, and he works uh, up in Alaska at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, so yeah, I've got a great team. I'm the only student on it. So um, I've been doing you know, much of the work kind of on my own and with them also. What does it mean to be on a team like this? What do you have to do when you wake up in the morning? Huh? Well, luckily for me, um, you know, like I said, I, I had no experience coming into this. So, they so you read books to try to get experience? Mostly journals, publications, um, Maria's like what, research. Like what, like what uh, journals? Oh, uh, gosh, what have I read? Well, so all, all the publications coming out of UH Manila pertaining to aquaculture, uh, whether it's directly related to shellfish or other species like shrimp or moi. Um, especially what I've been reading is literature on fish pond aquaculture. And so what I needed to know coming into this was why that hasn't been successful, at least not since, you know, they were used traditionally mm. as, um, as... So we're, we're talking about aquaculture today mm -hmm. then in Hawaii. Right. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and, you know, if you spent any time looking at the aquaculture community industry in California, you know, some things are happening there. Some and the things. East Coast, too, for that matter. The East Coast is really big on shellfish aquaculture, yeah, so yeah. They're, they're on the cutting edge, I think, them and, and the Pacific Northwest. But sort of the problem coming out of California is people are so far removed from where their food actually comes from, um, you know, because most of California is big agriculture and and even big fisheries. So there, if there is an aquaculture movement, it's, it's probably pretty small scale. Mm. And I think it's more, you know, limited to probably academia. Well, what's your characterization, perception of the aquaculture, aquaculture movement, if I could call it a movement? Mm -hmm. That's probably a misnomer movement uh, in Hawaii. I, I don't think that's a misnomer. I think there definitely is a movement. Um, it's definitely small, that's for sure, but because of the history of, of Hawaii and aquaculture, there's significantly less stigma on it. So if you, if you ever go to, for example, a fisheries conference, you'll find aquaculturists there too. And sometimes there's a bit of contention between the two groups because they're sort of competitors as far as producing food goes. 
Um, but here but in Hawaii, it's... Why can't the, the cowboys and the ranchers be friends? <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, it's, it's competition. So for the it's same area of ocean. Competition for resources, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Especially now that we have offshore aquaculture. So there's, um, you know, deep ocean, maybe not deep ocean, but say offshore mariculture. And so they're competing for the same open ocean resources. Um, where, where, do the, where does the Native Hawaiian movement, I'll call that a movement also, mm -hmm. Where does that fit? I mean, just a vignette here is that um, somebody we all know uh, went got a, a lease from uh, DLNR mm -hmm. for an open ocean aquaculture off Kona. Mm -hmm. Took a long time. Yeah. Took seven <laughs> or eight years to get this lease. Yeah. And finally, we got the lease. When he got the lease, the Native Hawaiians surfaced and created a contested case, and sure. they don't like it at all. Sure. And it's not so much a competition for ocean space. They just don't want them there at all. Mm -hmm. uh, the ocean is all theirs, and mm -hmm. they want to do what they want to do with the ocean, and they don't want anybody doing aquaculture. And they come up with all kinds of stuff about how uh, the fish poop goes on the bottom and creates an environmental <laughs> yeah. problem, which, which the, the experts tell you is just not the case. Mm -hmm. But um, suffice to say, uh, I don't think he got it off the ground yet after all this time. And I'm wondering what statement that makes about aquaculture in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's always going to be contentious because it's such a new thing. So there's really not a lot of research yet um, as far as, you know, what the, the environmental impacts are. And, you, of course, you have to understand, given the history of the state, um, you know, there, there were certainly rulers, if you're talking about the elite, but for the most part, things weren't privately owned the way we understand them in a Western context. So when you are allocating what people have for you know generations considered a public resource and then suddenly you know it's um, privately leased then i think that's where that contention comes from and like i said there's the concerns about the environmental impacts and even if there are studies that have shown that the the effluent from this open ocean mariculture is uh relatively uh, negligible um there's also this disconnect between i think Western science and cultural practices, mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's it's where the problem comes from. is in this too, you know. Yeah, so this it's the same thing as TMT. Mm -hmm. You know, don't build your telescope in our open ocean, right? Right. Um, because we we own the mountain, and mm -hmm. we, the mountain has significance for us yeah. culturally, and and it doesn't matter what the law is. It doesn't matter what the decisions have been. Right. We're going to oppose you anyway for as long as we live and breathe. Right. Which is happening. You know? Right. So I think the contention comes not so much from the actual act of the the aquaculture and the mariculture. I think this is this stems all the way back to. Uh, you know, hundreds of years of, of contention between uh, Hawaiians and, and Western influence, mm -hmm. which, which mm -hmm. I think is completely understandable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I try to walk a sensitive line between, you know... Uh, how, okay, let's talk about, let's focus in on what you're doing sure. in terms of oysters. Mm -hmm. That's why we entitled this show, The World is Our Oysters, because oysters are pretty popular. Mm -hmm. And Kulo Ranch wants to have oysters, or has oysters. They do. Mm -hmm. And uh, the question is, you know, whether we can do it well there, do it other places. Do we have the right environment, ocean right. environment, um, uh, business environment? Uh, that's always a question. Cultural environment. Mm -hmm. um, do we have the right market, you know, infrastructure? Um, and you're making a study of this from a business point of view. Tell us about it. Sure. Um, well, it's. I think it's a lot of business, but it's also a lot of what you mentioned about. Do we have the right environment? You know, do we have the right people, you know, is, is the state ready for this kind of thing? Um, so, wow, what are you, where do you even begin? When you say ready, you imply that someday it will be ready. Well, I, so... I, I'm not sure I, I find that there's necessarily a readiness in the future here. Mm. The question is exactly what happens, um, um, you know, whether it lurches forward, mm -hmm. <laughs> falls off the side, you know. I wouldn't say lurching. I'd say it's crawling forward. Thank you. <laughs> it's crawling forward. I right make now. my point. I have mm -hmm. my point. <laughs> yeah. But the, the reason for that is, well, you sort of have to understand the history of why this isn't already existing, right? So yeah. why now? Let's know. Let's, let's find yeah. out. I, I mean, I can tell you I've watched mm -hmm. it over the years, and it's remarkable mm -hmm. how little progress we've made. <laughs> so what, why has it not flowered out? Isn't this a perfect place mm -hmm. for all kinds of aquaculture, sure. both shellfish and fish and every kind of aquaculture mm -hmm. you can think of? Sure. That's, and that's a great question that almost everybody asks me. So I would say the biggest problem is actually permitting. 
because there are so many regulations concerning coastal waters. So you've got permits at the federal level, the state level, and the county level. Um, so anything on water that's navigable is, um, you know, you need a permit for that. Why? So I mean, if, if I make you queen, mm -hmm. you can be queen. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to have three levels of permits? Ooh, that is a good question. Do we need to have three levels? Uh, whew, I'm going to say yes, because I think when you have all three levels of jurisdiction, there's a balance of power. So if you ever, you know... That's a political question. I mean... I suppose, you, right. You, you, you want to satisfy all the political interests of political constituents, the political constituencies and government sovereignty mm -hmm. kind. But, um, if, but let, me, let me flip it a little bit mm -hmm. and say, from the point of view of developing an industry, do we need three levels of permits? At that point, for the sake of the industry, I would think my personal opinion is probably most of that jurisdiction would fall within the state. State can handle that. I think so, yeah. yeah. The Corps of Engineers really doesn't, uh, or the federal government doesn't really have a, a no. as much of an interest in this. Yeah, thing. not not in particular, only because there's, there's such a strong military presence here, which is, I think, why that that no. level is involved. You mean the oysters could be um, a strategic um, military issue? <laughs> More like the, <laughs> the areas they're based out of, oh, okay. right? So okay. We're talking about, you know, extremely valuable coastal waters, especially uh, bays, right? Because bays are great for growing oysters because you kind of want this protected area. Um, and then, so, of course, when there are bays involved, those are usually strategic military points as oh. well. Okay, so if, but if I asked you from an environmental point of view, I mean, not that many issues. It, uh, are these oysters going to be a problem environmentally? Are they going to force out some other species? Um, are they going to create some kind of, you know, toxic um, product that will mm -hmm. damage, uh, you know, the rest of the environment? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, how many issues could there be? Is it going to have a negative effect on that, that area of that place in the mm -hmm. environment? That's the only issue I can think of. Yeah. Yeah. Which is the, so, the one most people ask me. So yeah. so how long does it take to get a permit? Ooh. In my friend's case, it was <laughs> seven or eight years, and it, it actually didn't help. Ooh, in wow. the case of TMT on the Big Island, it was seven or eight years, and mm -hmm. that didn't help either. Yeah. Uh, so how long does it take to get a permit for an aquaculture facility in Hawaii? Ooh, you know, it's so specific to each, each place. I would say you can definitely bank on a few years mm -hmm. minimum for open ocean like you said, seven or eight years, that's because it's, I think, so much more complicated um, because that is open ocean. But in, in the case of, let's say, a privately owned fish pond that, again, it's privately owned, so that avoids a few of those complications, you know, if you have at least jurisdiction over the land, if not the water. Um, so I would say you can probably I, I really don't know, to be honest, how long it would take. Well, in the end, in the end, it is an economic question. Mm -hmm. When we get back from this break, we're going to talk to Jesse Chen, a student of, um, I guess, public policy, economics, and environmental management. We're going to talk to her about the world is our oysters, and um, I guess I guess we're going to see about the economic feasibility mm -hmm. from the point of view of the investor, the manager, mm -hmm. um, the the food producer. Mm -hmm. um, is this a feasible thing to do, or should we bring all of our oysters in from Guam, uh, from uh, Bolivia? <laughs> we'll be right back. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Aloha. My name is Danelia, D-A-N-E-L-I-A. -E and I'm the other half of the duo, John Newman. Welcome. We are co-hosts of a show called Keys to Success, which is live on the Think Tech Live Network series weekly on Thursdays at 11 a.m. We're looking forward to seeing you then. Aloha! Hi, I'm Stacey Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacey to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha, 
see you then. Bingo. And, uh, you know, the regrettable thing is if you weren't here for our break where we got into some really interesting questions, <laughs> <laughs> which uh, Jesse, Ken, and I are now going to cover. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, so forget about the permits. Okay. I'm going to build a tank in my backyard. Sure. And I'm going to run water, you know, seawater, if you like, through this tank. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to grow those oysters, as some aquaculture producers do, mm -hmm. you know, in a tank on the land. And great, great oysters. Really tasty. Mm -hmm. Maybe <laughs> even pearls. Who knows what? So why can't I do that? So that would be utility costs. So they're... What do I need utilities for that? So, you t so if you've got a man-made system, the one that you just described, which is completely controlled... Um, you're talking about constantly running water, you're going to need bubblers to oxygenate the water, um, you're going to have to grow the algae in an entirely separate system, which uses a lot of electricity and a lot of manpower. Um, and well, that, so that's not utility. Now. We're, first, we're talking about utility. Just uh, utility. Okay. So electricity and water, then you're talking about. Um, and, of course, that's extremely expensive, as everyone knows here. Do I need water temperature of a certain range? Um, you do. It depends on the species, and I'm not a biologist, so I can't tell you exactly, to be honest. But they do grow in the waters here off the coast, so they can handle fairly so whatever, warm water. So whatever average seawater temperature yeah, is, that would work. Yeah, it's actually quite Even good. if it's warmer than it is in, say, Maine. Definitely. Actually, so during winter, they don't grow much. Yeah. Mm, mm, so the mm. warm water is actually what makes them grow so fast mm, here. We want that. We could, yeah. Again, we could be a great center for growing oysters. To a because certain of extent, that. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. don't want to cross the threshold. Now, otherwise. What was the point about labor? You said labor was a problem. Too. Labor. Yeah. So, so what we were talking about earlier was why does this exist right now? Why is this just happening right now? So there have been oysters grown here in the past. Um, I believe the last time oysters were actually documented as growing here was back in the 1980s on a land-based system. And so all these land-based systems obviously didn't make it for one reason or another. Maybe not the sole reason, but a huge factor certainly was the cost of utilities. And so that kind of brings us to where we are today. So the advantage of growing the mountain fish ponds is that it's relatively, uh, it's, it's labor intensive as far as culling and sorting goes. But the, sa the same labor intensive. Whether it's out in the ocean or on land. I would say quite a bit less labor intensive. Uh, in the ocean. This, this way. Yeah, in a fish pond. Maybe not open ocean, but in a fish pond. Mm -hmm. um, because you don't need to grow the algae. So the oysters that so that's, are out that's there. That's food. So, so, so right. you, have, you have double work if you have to grow both the oysters and the food. Exactly. Mm. Right. Um, and so here in the fish pond, they're just, they're just growing out there naturally. And they get pulled in to get sorted and cleaned and things like that. Um, You're making me hungry. But, yeah, <laughs> you should try them. They're great. Um, and so I actually, if you, I hope you get a chance to go out and check it out someday. Well, what is it like? Let's talk about Kualoa for a minute. Mm -hmm. What have they got going, and why is it feasible for them? Mm -hmm. So it's been feasible for them because they have so much resources to start off. So they've already got, you know, employees who are trained in aquaculture, and they've already got the facility, most importantly. So a lot of fish ponds. And they've got a permit. And they've got all the permits they need. Mm -hmm. So they're doing everything by the book. And they've got this amazing fish pond, which also the, the key thing for them is they're in a great location. So one problem you might have with other fish ponds is um, runoff from, from urban um, oh, I mean, areas From nearby. above the fish pond runs into the ocean right. and contaminates the bed. Exactly, mm. yeah. So you're talking about runoff from... Um, you know, vehicles or lawn fertilizers. They don't have that? They have a ranch right above the pond, yeah. Yeah, you know what? It's not been a problem for them. They, mm. They've been tested. DOH comes down every month and tests the water, and, and they're always in the clear. Um, but I think they're far enough away in the country to where it's, it's negligible. It's an amazing company, I, I must say. Cool Oil Ranch is so. just a brilliant company. They, they've done so many incredible things with that land. Mm -hmm. It's just it's, a, it's an inspiration to all of us. Cool Oil Ranch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, if you talk to them and you ask them, why are you doing this? You know, why aren't you using the pond for something else? They'll tell you the same thing, that they're really they're interested in, in seeing the fish pond produce something, you know, viable. Um, and Could they produce more? 
cook more oysters or more anything. Well, they produce other things besides oysters, as I remember, yeah? Uh, they, they used to. I'm not sure about today. I know they're probably capable, but when you're talking about polyculture, it gets a lot more complicated. Because you have to, you have to make sure that one's not impeding the right, other. Right, yeah. yeah. You have to know how the different species you're growing together. These chemical and biological issues. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So let's say it's just oysters. Can they mm -hmm. produce more oysters? Could they produce more? Um... You know, I think that they're, they are right now, they're working on it. So when I started with them, uh, and I can't, you know, tell you how much because that's sort of sensitive, but um, I can tell you that in the last two years since I've been working on this project, they've already ramped up production. So what they started off with when their first oyster hit the market, um, they're definitely producing more now than what they did then. Okay, so let's, let's say, and it sounds to me like they're having a good experience, mm -hmm. let's say that. Um, and that they've learned a lot of stuff, and you learn a lot of stuff, and not mm -hmm. only in terms of the biology, um, but also on the business end of it, to make it work, to make mm -hmm. the expenses less than the market price. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, there's, there's a real mm, positive mm, spin to say to somebody in a hotel in Waikiki, these are local oysters, mm -hmm. man, local they oysters. Yeah. They're clean, they're fresh, <laughs> the water in Hawaii, never better, you mm -hmm. know. Um, and so why can't we cover the cover the shoreline mm -hmm. with similar facilities? Mm -hmm. Why can't we do? Shouldn't we do that from a macro point of view now? Okay. Shouldn't we do that in Hawaii? Why? Why shouldn't we do that now? Absolutely yeah. yes. I think <clears throat> we we would love to see more. And um, personally, I think it's feasible. I I think so. So I'll tell you a little bit about the economic study. So. Long story short, after collecting all the data and constructing sort of a model farm, so not Kulua exactly because they're kind of a special case um, being such a, a large company. So I constructed a model case that was sort of more like, um, like auntie and uncle's fish pond that they're sort of running themselves with a couple of employees. And based off that model, the, the return is marginal, which means they're kind of on the borderline. So it's a little bit in the red based off my model. Um, but the difference between, you know, breaking even and not breaking even is a few thousand oysters. And, um, so, and you can make that up. You can, you can somehow make that up. Maybe you can increase the price a little bit. Exactly. Uh, a little branding, who knows what. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which brings me to um, the, so another part of the study was figuring out what are the most sensitive parts of it. So, you know, what is it that's causing you to, to tip one way or the other? And so two of the most sensitive you know, parts of your budget you're talking about are one, your yield, and two, your market price. Above all else, even more important than the costs of your labor or the costs of your, your utilities or, or even your rent, those are going to be the two things that you're going to want to focus on the most. Mm -hmm. And so at the moment, what we're trying to do is figure out, at least on the marketing side, is there a way to sort of, um, you know, play up the oysters so that they, they are sort of a... Um, like a quality product over what you would get from the mainland. You mean, you mean trying to like a show excellence, brand, like a premium. Mar marketing, right. premium, premium, premium quality. Yeah. Why can't we, we can do that. So I, I'd buy that. Sure, we I'd could. I'd buy it. Yeah, absolutely. So like you were mentioning about the these sort of white tablecloth restaurants in Waikiki, you know, can you sell this quality to them? I think you can. I think absolutely you can. Yeah. I think. And like Kona Coffee, you mm -hmm. know, you can make Hawaii oysters and brand them as the best oysters in the world mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, we, we do that with, uh, with the brewed shrimp, the mm -hmm. shrimp stock, yeah. and sell it to Thailand, and in Thailand in the fish ponds, they, you know, they generate all these fabulous shrimp off our mm -hmm. brood stock, and our brood stock are presented at uh, Oceanic Institute. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's really amazing what kind of reputation we have mm -hmm. in, in the brood stock business. We could do the same thing with oysters. Absolutely, we could. Yeah. So What I about the oyster seed? Can you can you produce oyster seed at Kualoa so that it's a high quality seed like the, the shrimp brood stock? Mm -hmm. So that's a good question. And even though they're, we're talking about the same species and shellfish, the brood stock sort of operation isn't a completely different operation than growing them out. It requires completely different facilities um, and a completely different. It's a laboratory set of, setting. Yeah, diff, different knowledge base entirely. Because yeah. now you're talking about. What you'll need is biologists. You know, you need people who maybe have a pedigree of really high quality broodstock. And the way you you grow, uh, the way you breed oysters and um, 
you know, raise them in a nursery is completely different than uh, the way you grow them out for market. Mm -hmm. And so that is that requires a lot of capital. Yeah. But well, and and what I hear uh, interlinea here is that we don't have that. We don't on Oahu. We do in Kona. So, oh yeah, we're doing oysters in Kona. So there, are, there are several oyster hatcheries um, at Noah. I, I know there are shellfish out there. Mm -hmm. The Seattle company, I forget the name right now, has a big operation doing shellfish out there. There's, there's uh, actually you know, quite a few oysters too. Huh? Yeah. So here's my question to you, actually. I mean, should you decide to answer it? Because mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we're about out of time. Oh, okay. <clears throat> are we going to make it here? Are we going to have an industry for? premium oysters that will be, you know, that the bat, the world will be the path to our door that we can ship, export elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Will we be able to stock every white table and brown table and green table restaurant in Waikiki mm -hmm. with as many oysters as people would like to eat? Mm -hmm. Or is this going to go the way of so many other aquaculture, you know, enterprises mm -hmm. over the past 30 years uh, and ultimately not be, not be feasible for us? Mm -hmm. So what's your answer? It's a combination of the two, sort of right in between. It is feasible, but not on the scale that you just described. Not, we're not, probably not going to become a leading exporter of oysters, certainly. But can we at least satisfy some of the local demand? I think absolutely yes. Um, it's going to be a small sort of niche market, um, at least initially, until we can really start competing with mainland growers. So right now, I think the best bet, uh, the best opportunity for the local industry to stay on top is to market it as a specialty product, sort of to these you know more higher end restaurants that are looking for that really fresh, really local, one of a kind product. Um, but I don't think we're at that point just yet, anyway, mm -hmm. to be able to completely um, replace all that we're importing with locally grown. But, you know, every, every oyster is, is, is a step in the right direction. Well, if you keep working on it, mm -hmm. maybe it'll happen. Yeah. All I can hope. say is, is, you know, far, uh, not a whole lot of foods that appeal to me mm -hmm. as much as an oyster with some sharp oyster sauce Good and all hear. that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I can taste it now. I may go out afterward. And, of course, as they do in Seattle, you put the oyster in a shot glass of, of, of uh, gin. Mm. And then gin? Well, yeah. <laughs> Vodka? Yeah. Mm, better than gin. This could be very popular. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Yeah, rather, sorry, I'm sorry. Jesse, thank you, Jesse. Thank Jesse you for having Jen. me.